Hello, folks, and welcome back to English 280 with me, Dr. Matt Barton. Today we are discussing narrative. <laughs> How do games tell stories? What are stories? What are characters? What's a good story? What's a bad story? How does uh, making it interactive impact the storytelling process? So a lot of good stuff in this chapter. I think you'll find this enjoyable. Uh, here's the objectives for today. I want to talk about how storytelling works in games, how it's different than in novels or films. Uh, we'll compare and contrast the player's experience, so playing a game versus reading a story or watching a story in the form of a TV show. Uh, then we'll look briefly, very briefly, at just some literary theories for analyzing video games. And I'm missing one of the objectives here, but the fourth one will be, how do you create your own narrative uh, for games? Because I want to... I started getting you set up for your twine game. Now, all right, question one. Uh, so I want you to think about a video game that you've played uh, that you feel, uh, feel had a great story. And, you know, I keep getting these responses like, well, I don't play games. You know, and that's not going to cut it, folks. <laughs> At the very least, you played Life is Strange, uh, which is well known for uh, its storyline. So that's fine. You could talk about that game if you're not familiar with other ones. That is absolutely fine. Uh, but anyway, what stands out to you about that story? Is it the plot, you know, the, the series of events, the way the story is told? Uh, is it more about the characters and your interactions with them? Is it, is it the setting where the game takes place that captures your interest? Some combination of all of those things. Uh, uh, if, you're, if it's asking you to make choices, does it, the, does, how much does the game change depending on the choice that you make? Is it just kind of a superficial thing or does it have an impact on the story? Uh, so think about all that stuff, and then uh, ask yourself if it could have been told equally well in another medium. So would Life is Strange, for example, work just as well as a comic book? Would it be just as good in, in a, as a film? Uh, or is there something special about it as a game narrative? Uh, so I know there's a lot to unpack there, so just take some time with this. Write about 100 words, 100 words about it, and then come back and we'll continue. All right, they talk a little bit about the history of narratives in games. And as you know, this is my favorite topic. You know, I love uh, thinking about the evolution of games over time. It's something I've written a lot about. Uh, but I got some examples here on the slide for you. The uh, This is a shot from Ms. Pac-Man, one of the early 80s arcade games. But even the first Pac-Man game had some of these little cutscenes. I don't know if they referred to them as cutscenes back then. Uh, but you'd beat a level, and every so often there would be a little... A little play, basically, a little thing uh, acted out. Miss Pac-Man chasing Pac-Man. I think later on there's some Pac-Babies. <laughs> so, uh, they leave some uh, some things to the imagination uh, with that. But it, basically, it's a little story. You know, it's kind of a cutesy thing. It's more than just gobbling up the pellets. Uh, this one is that Mystery House game I was telling you about a couple lectures ago. You can see how I was saying that it just looks <laughs> sort of laughably bad. <laughs> the artwork there. Uh, but it is. It tries to tell the story. It's kind of a clue-like game. Uh, you know, you could talk about clue in terms of a game narrative as well because you kind of create a story every time. But that's basically the, the story there. Uh, over here is Zork, which you hopefully played a little bit uh, a couple lectures ago again. And you can see that is kind of a story. You know, you read the text, you read a description of a room, uh, an object, and then you make some uh, inputs. Uh, over here we have uh, Shigeru Miyamoto's, his sort of breakout hit, Donkey Kong. And you could probably tell just by looking at the screenshot, if you've never played the game, you should really play it out. Uh, but you can sort of see how this is reminiscing on uh, something like King Kong, uh, that sort of film era. You know, the big big gorilla, the big ape, and the menacing, the uh, damsel, I guess, or the princess, I forget what her name is <laughs> in this. Uh, but there's sort of a basic storyline that goes with this and cutscenes as well. Very, it's, it's a lot more like movies than something like Asteroids or a Pong. Uh, and then at the lower left we have a scene from King's Quest where I think this is much better than Mystery House. Uh, so these, you have little character, little characters you're running around, these a lot better artwork. It's kind of a fairy tale. Uh, Roberta Williams wrote this game, and she, she basically took a bunch of old fairy tales and spun them all into one big narrative. So you see there, there's something about Little Red Riding Hood, accepting uh, the baskets of goodies. Uh, so you're solving puzzles, going around, finding out things. 
uh, to uh, win the game. Uh, just to kind of continue on this theme a little bit more, uh, we mentioned Pong, but I don't know if I really talked about Breakout. So you might have heard of a man named Steve Jobs, uh, creator of Apple. Uh, another person that helped him was Steve Wozniak, or Woz. And I always feel bad for Woz because he was really, to me, the, sort of the brains <laughs> behind the operation. <laughs> Uh, so he's kind of the nerdy one, so nobody ever talks about him. It's always uh, jobs, jobs, jobs. But anyway, the two of the the two of them got their start. You know, as, as I guess this is their breakout hit, if you will. <laughs> but just look at the game over here. I'll play the video here, so you can just see what that looks like. Okay, so you, if you look here, you've got the dials, or right here actually, there's a knob that you turn left and right that is controlling that paddle. So in that way, it's very similar to Pong, but look what happens here. Let's see, sooner or later, there should be. This must be the Atari version. Okay, let me just move it forward here a little bit. There we go. So you see that little ball coming down, and instead of just having a player that you play with, it goes up, hits that little piece of the, the wall. Okay, and that's basically the game right there in a nutshell. Uh, now here is the arcade cabinet. So what I want you to look at here is the artwork around this cabinet. And you can see it looks sort of like these guys, these prisoners breaking out of a jail, or breaking through a wall. And so the, to me this is kind of like The Great Escape or uh, something like Shawshank Redemption. It's, it's humorous obviously. Uh, but even with this very simple abstract sort of gameplay, you know they could have just said well, here's a game where you have a block and you're bouncing a little block, a smaller block up and down and you're hitting other blocks. Woohoo! What a game! You know, <laughs> it's so exciting. <laughs> uh, but even with this box art or the cabinet art, they're able to suggest there's more going on here. You're trying, you know, somehow or another, you're a prisoner in the jail and you're breaking through the wall to escape the prison. So there's a little bit of a hint there, I would say of something going on that makes the gameplay more meaningful than if it was just, well, your blocks, moving blocks around. Uh, of course, something like Tetris, that's literally all you're doing. <clears throat> but even there, you know, if you play the Nintendo versions or the arcade versions, uh, they try to suggest this sort of vaguely a uh, Soviet-Russian theme with the music and everything to kind of make it seem somehow tied into that, you know, it puts, puts sort of thoughts in your head of... Uh, the Soviet Union or Russian traditions and things. Of course, some of the later versions do have a story elements uh, more directly in there, but that, that's probably pretty abstract. <laughs> you know, it's one of the few really popular games that, other than something like Solitaire, uh, that a lot of people play that has very little in the way of a story. All right, some of the other things they talk about in here, the games that are based on movies, and there's about a billion of these. It's a lot of fun if you if you like the Nintendo era or the Super Nintendo. You can find these sites where they have basically all the Super Nintendo games ever and you can just play them. <laughs> There's so many <laughs> that you probably have never heard of. Like this this is a game based on Beethoven's second. I don't know what it is. I'm always kind of fascinated by these dog movies. <laughs> They're just fun to watch. I mean who doesn't like a good dog movie, right? Uh, I remember Benji back in the day. Uh, but they even tried to make a game based on this. So, you know, I don't remember. It's been a while since I've seen this movie. But I, I don't remember it being all about uh, Beethoven here jumping over fences. <laughs> that would have been in a pretty strange film. Uh, but there's enough, you know, it kind of looks like the character. It kind of looks like the setting enough where it kind of makes you feel like, well, okay, I can sort of suspend disbelief a little bit here. Imagine that I'm running, running around in Beethoven, <laughs> the movie. A bit of a stretch, admittedly. You know, some of these games don't work too well. But it's it's amazing how many there are. They they took just any game and they would make a platformer game out of it like this. You know, you're jumping over something or climbing up a wall or you're shooting things. <laughs> it's a very uh, questionable connection to, to the film. But still, if this were just, a, you know, a block running around jumping over blocks, you know, it wouldn't have the, uh, the appeal. Uh, let's see, moving on. Uh, this is an, an interesting example of a... So that breakout game I was showing you earlier, 
So what happens is once the computers and the arcade machines get a little bit more advanced, they start having more memory, more storage space, more colors, more, more graphics. They could start doing more in the way of story instead of just having some pictures on an arcade cabinet. Now they can actually have a little movie that plays to set up and explain what's going on. So here's, I, I picked this game, it's called Arkanoid. You know, I played the hell out of this, <laughs> my sister and I both, uh, as kids. But it's very similar to that breakout game. So it's not fundamentally different. You know, it's got more bells and whistles. But I just want you to pay attention as I play this to how they set up the story. Let's see if I can make this. Uh, I don't know if I'll be able to make it full screen here. But, uh, yeah, here we go. So you can see what's happened here. They have added a little bit of a very maybe just a few seconds you know you're on this spaceship you get you know you take this escape pod and some some aliens i guess have transported you here and now you have to uh, break through uh the wall you know again it's a lot more advanced in terms of colors and graphics and uh, all of that stuff but you know the idea is they've, they've again taken this somewhat abstract concept of just bouncing a pixel up and down and knocking out cubes or blocks and they've tried to add, make it more of a narrative by adding this whole story about, let me just back it up here, a few uh, scenes so you can see this again. And so now you got this mothership and an alien uh, mysterious force that has trapped you here. And, it, you know, the idea there is that that will give you some added motivation to complete the game, to see who, who was it that trapped you here. All right, so then these authors move into talking about what is a narrative. You I know, mean, what do we mean to use this term all the time? You know, there's a whole bunch of terms that we use without ever really thinking about the actual definition. And, of course, people disagree about these definitions, so it just goes on and on. Uh, but they just say a narrative is a succession of events. So it's once upon a time this happened, then this happened, then that happened. And there's some kind of connection between all those events or happenings. <laughs> That's what makes it a story instead of just a random series, right? There, there's got to be some connection uh, between these events. Uh, you know, Aristotle, I think he defines this simply as something with a beginning, middle, and an end. <laughs> so, so something happens, it goes on for a while, and then it comes to some kind of conclusion. Uh, so that's a pretty basic definition. Uh, so they break it up a little bit into these components. They talk about the chronological order of the events themselves. So I, I just think about this as the story. And when I'm talking about this in my classes, I like to use the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You know, or one of these sort of fairy tales you've heard a, a, bil a million times. It could be Cinderella, the Little Mermaid, whatever. Uh, but there's certain things that have to happen in that story for it to be Goldilocks and, th and the Three Bears, right? You could probably get away with changing it from bears to walruses or huskies. You know, you could change Goldilocks's name. Uh, you could set it in a different era, you know, put it in uh, the, the ancient uh, Egypt. <laughs> you could move it to uh, somewhere in space, a different planet. Uh, that would still be fine. It'd still be Goldilocks and the Three Bears. But, it, you know, once you get rid of the idea of those three beds and the three, you know, food items and Goldilocks having to get just the right one, you know, that's the sort of thing that makes it Goldilocks, right? And if you took that... He took certain things out, it would no longer be the story. And so that's the way I like to think about this. You know, there's a certain story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You can play around a whole lot with the way you, you tell that story, but uh, nevertheless, to be Goldilocks, it has to have uh, the girl or, or child, at least, and then these uh, three beings of different ages and different uh, <laughs> bed sizes and what have you. Uh, so that's the story. Then they had the text, so the verbal or visual representation. So I say, here's Goldilocks and the Three Bears, right? And I hand you this, hand you a book of stories, and you know, you look, you open it up. Yep, there's the chapter. <laughs> there it is. It's in words. <laughs> or I say, here's Goldilocks and the Three Bears. I hand it to you, and now it's a DVD. Uh, it's a cartoon. Same story. Just a one's a cartoon. One's a uh, a, a, st a short story, uh, maybe there's even a poem, uh, who knows, it could be in the form of a song, a record, uh, but the idea is it's still Goldilocks and the Three Bears if it has that story. doesn't matter so much, you can change up the way it's told, or the, uh, the medium. And then they, this last one is kind of weird. Uh, so the act of telling or writing 
or narrating it, who is narrating or telling the story. So this one, like I say, is kind of wonky. You know, on the one hand, I think about it in terms of you could have Goldilocks and the Three Bears from the perspective of Goldilocks, or from the perspective of uh, uh, one of the bears, maybe. You know, so you could do something like that. Or, of course, you could have a famous narrator, uh, somebody with a lot of character. You know, who is it? Uh, Samuel L. Jackson that does narrate some of these classic stories with a, a little bit of change. You know, he puts, he puts uh, some of his own, uh, you know, persona into those way he tells those stories. So that, that you know, okay, I sort of get what they're saying there. You can sort of have this narrator come in uh, and change the way the story is told. You also have the, you know, I would also include things there like the, the you know, the idea we've, we said before about you, you can go see a play. You know, what is Hamlet? You know, is Hamlet just the thing that you read in an English class and you're just reading it silently? You know, is that Hamlet? Uh, or is it you go to, to the theater, you know, student theater, whatever, you see the play acted out. You're there in the theater. Hamlet is happening. You know, this is Hamlet. Uh, look at those actors. Look at, you know, this is happening right now. It's in the present tense. And so I sort of see some of that overlap as well in that concept. Now, let's see, fictional worlds. Uh, so here they're trying to separate out the idea of the story from the world that the story takes place in. And there's a lot of connections. There's a lot of overlap. You know, the, a, lot of this, a lot of the story is about this world and exploring the world. And I like the point they made earlier about how the, the best stories or the best sort of tales that get turned into games... Uh, usually those are have a travel motif. You know, you're going from all these weird places. You know, that works out pretty well for a game because it kind of puts you in the shoes of that explorer. And you're kind of there exploring uh, the world, trying to get through it. Uh, so I, I like that connection. Uh, but they just say a fictional world is an imaginary construct created by the descriptions of a text. So if you're reading something like The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, uh, say you've read the Harry Potter books, right? you probably have this idea of what Hogwarts is like. And you imagine, I would like to be a student at Hogwarts. And you can sort of put yourself in that, you can sort of imagine what that would be like and even create your own stories based on that uh, experience of being in, being in Hogwarts. So that's the fictional world. You could write a million stories set in that same world. And the same thing with, the, with games here. Of course, instead of a text, you might have some text that says, you know, what, where this is, what time zone it is, what time period it is, and uh, so on. But, you know, of course, mostly what we do is see the, the graphics, see the type of creatures there. And that's the idea, impression we get of that world. I would also add the, the, the audio, the music plays a large role in that. So here's the problem with games as narratives, and this is why all these movie critics, who is it, uh, Roger Ebert, I think, or Siskel, criticized games it's the games are terrible they'll never be good storytelling machines because you have to let it has to be interactive so they see this as a negative like it can't be a good story if you're letting the player make decisions about how it turns out uh, that's just going to be crap because uh, it, you know that you're the professional storyteller right and you're sort of handing control over to somebody who's an amateur you know for all intents and purposes somebody that doesn't really have a good sense of what makes for a good story and just saying, here, go do what you like, <laughs> you know, come up with your own story. Uh, so some folks see that as sort of a cop out, like that's not what makes compelling uh, movies, uh, for example. It, you know, if you could think about all the movies where somebody dies in the movie uh, and you say, well, if that was a game, you could just let them reload, try it again. OK, now they live. Uh, the character survives. Everybody's happy. It's a happy ending now instead of that tragic ending you know imagine like titanic <laughs> you know, there's like a certain sequence and you're like okay if i go here just the right time okay now there's no the ship doesn't sink uh, everybody's fine uh there's no iceberg you know like okay just steer now i've avoided the iceberg you know that would be the <laughs> about the least interesting story ever right there has to be uh you sort of have to you know if the ship doesn't sink it's not titanic you know kind of coming back to that idea so I'm trying to do this. I don't necessarily, I don't really agree with this. I'm just trying to give you the impression of what they're trying to argue there. Uh, that if the, to the extent that you can do whatever you like, or you're not making an interesting story. You're kind of ceding that responsibility over. 
be sort of like a novelist if you said, okay, you decide how this story ends. And some people like that, but I think most people feel cheated by that. Like, well, I don't, you know, I don't need you for that. And I can come up with a story. I mean, you're this professional. <laughs> you know, I, I want to hear your story the way you want to tell the story. Uh, that's why I'm here, because uh, I like, you know, you. You're, you're the best storyteller. You're better than me, hopefully. Uh, so that's another perspective there. Uh, okay, uh, so obviously we don't agree with that assessment, although I think it has some valid points. Uh, but what exactly is the relationship between a fictional game world and a gameplay experience? And this is where they start getting into all these different theories. Uh, I kind of like this one here. And so let's see, this is Lisbeth Klastrup, and she talks about how game worlds are like, quote, the stage of a play. It is meant for action, but many of the elements are there to be seen and not used. So I think this is pretty apt. You know, if you do see stage plays, you know there's a there's people that do the scenery, there's people that do the props. You know, these are jobs. Sometimes there's whole crews that just do things like prop, uh, the prop master and so on. So it's not as though they're just putting just random objects on the stage, right? Everything is there for some kind of purpose to suggest a, a setting. Uh, maybe there's some props that they interact with, go pick up, do things with. Other things are just there basically for decoration. And we see the same sort of thing in games, right? Here's one of my favorite games, The uh, Secret of Monkey Island. So when you look at this, you can see there's certain objects there. Now, I'm not playing the game, but... If the game we're running, you can see as I move the mouse around, if it's something I could pick up, the little arrow would change a little bit, the mouse pointer, indicating, hey, you can go pick that up, or you can go talk to this person. Uh, whereas other things, maybe there's, it's just there for decoration, like probably this rope back there. You know, I probably can't do anything with the rope. I click on it, nothing happens. Uh, so she, I think Elizabeth uh, Clashtup is right here. There's certainly some, I think you can make a pretty good comparison uh, of this you know some things are there just to be seen some things are there to be used and a lot of that is up to the gameplay designers and you know, as we'll see you know let me just go back to this real quick so it could be that they just say well let's just make everything where you can go pick it up you can move it around you know everything will be interactive but sometimes that actually doesn't turn out to be a good thing because you it's just too much stuff you kind of get overwhelmed you don't really have a sense of like what am i supposed to do uh, where do I go? What, what's an important object and what's just unimportant? So one of the things a gameplay designer does is say, well, if you can't pick it up, you can't look at it, you can't talk to it, it's probably not important. <laughs> you know, if I can go over here and pick up this mug of uh, beer or root beer, whatever it is, uh, then it's probably going to have something to do with a puzzle somewhere. I should probably, you know, pick it up, think about where I might be using that beer. Maybe I have to put something in the beer. You know, it's just thing, ideas occur to me when you know that, that there's something about this mug of beer. I don't necessarily know what it is yet. I just know something is important about it. So that helps helps you as a player, you know, figure out what does the writer want me, or what is the game designer hinting at here? What are they suggesting? What do I need to do to get this to the next level? Okay, it's, you know, fascinating stuff. Uh, this is another good concept, too the idea of the game space. So instead of the game world here, we're talking about the space, the actual game space, the parts you can explore, walk around, do things in. Uh, so sometimes you can't really interact with anything. You're kind of re very limited as to where you can go in a game world. Maybe you can't even, uh, maybe all you can do is just click to go to the next screen. Like here's a, the one in the middle here is called Myst. M-Y-S-T. It's a big groundbreaking CD-ROM game. I'm pretty sure I've talked about it before. But the thing about this game, it looks kind of like a first-person shooter if you just looked at the screenshot. But I can't actually just go W-A-S-D or use a gamepad to move through it smoothly. Uh, instead, I just have to find a certain spot on the screen to click on, you know, sort of maybe up that trail a little bit. And then it will just kind of jump to the next screen, kind of like a, almost like a PowerPoint slide. If you could imagine this, I could click on different parts of the screen to go to different slides. Uh, it's basically a mist. So, you know, I might be able to click over here somewhere and kind of go to the left, but it would just kind of jump to that uh, next perspective. So, uh, as a game space, it's not very 
interactive, right? It doesn't feel very much like the real world. Whereas over here we have uh, uh, the latest flight simulator, Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. So you, you might have even have thought this was just a photograph, right, from a cockpit of a real plane. <laughs> but it is a, a flight simulator. It's a game, basically. So you can see just how realistic that looks. And, you know, this Microsoft, I want to pick this example because it's a good example of a game where, you know, there's certain things about flying an aircraft that it's, you, you know, you have to go to school for this and take classes and, like, really learn. There's a, there's a pretty steep learning curve to becoming a pilot, uh, even if you just want to fly around your, you know, privately, not not being a passenger, you know, not not being a professional pilot, but even if you just want to have a, as a hobby, flying, there's a lot to learn. You know, years of study, simulations like this. Uh, but obviously, if they put all that into the game, nobody could play it except for these professional pilots. So basically, what they do is, you know, you could think about it as a dumbing down, if you like. I, I tend to think about it more just kind of filtering out the stuff that's not so much fun to think about. Uh, and just put in the parts that are fun and then just kind of leaving out the stuff that's not fun and then it leaves you with a very nice experience and i think with the, this flight simulator game i think you can select like i want it very real realistic or i want something more uh, friendly to play more casual uh, so it lets you do that but still you can see how this is a good example it's reproducing some of the features of the real world of what it's like to really fly uh, but it's also not being too strict because they want to make a good game. <laughs> it has to facilitate the gameplay, right? And I, I would say the same things with a lot of these games. It could be very realistic. You might have to find food and drink and all this, but I've, I've yet to play a game where you're going to the bathroom. You know, I stand corrected. There is a game. Uh, blanking on the name. It's one of these survival games, but <laughs> you actually can, you can poop in that game. Now, that's the only one I can think of, though. You know, most of the time, I think quite rightfully, they say, we'll just kind of skip over that part, you know. And then on the right, we have uh, Grand Theft Auto 3. You know, this game it gets brought up all the time in game studies. Uh, just because it does, there's this sort of mass. This was, a, I think, maybe the first time a console game really had this massive interactive open world. You know, it felt like there's so many things you could do. You could see all this stuff. You weren't tie you you know you weren't forced uh, to play the game a certain way just kind of whatever you wanted to do and one of the things that people talked about was the cars and so you can get in a car you can hijack it and drive around and it's fun but it's not exactly a realistic car game you know there's all kinds of car racing games that are a lot more realistic than this uh, so this was just kind of more people would say it's more casual it's just kind of a more fun uh, driving simulator uh, than those uh, hardcore simulators. Uh, so again, just thinking about the fictional world that you're building, uh, what you're going to allow there, how realistic do you want it to be, uh, and what's fun uh, versus just what's going to be cumbersome. And here's the definition of the cutscenes. So they, they define a cutscene, and I'm trying to remember, some of you might not know this. <laughs> I don't want to take for granted that you know, already know this stuff. <laughs> uh, so a cutscene Here's the definition, a cinematic sequence used to relay information to the player. Uh, okay, now, let's just take a look at one. So this is the game Castlevania Symphony of the Night. So it's one of these platform games you're running around, you have, you're you know, dealing with enemies and whatnot, but there's a story that goes with it. And this is how the story gets told in this cutscene. So what happens, the action freezes, I can't move around or anything during this process. I can just sit here and look at what's happening. And they tried to make this cinematic in that you can see the characters. It's, you know, they don't, I don't know if they, I'm pretty sure this game does have the, uh, this is a YouTube video, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it does have the voice, uh, voice acting on here. But uh, anyway, you can see how they're, if you play this, there's music, there's a voice actor. But the idea, the reason they call it a cut scene is that you stop playing for a while, you sit back and you see what's happening. And that's the way the story gets told is with these uh, cut scenes. So it sort of cuts you out of the gameplay for a second to tell the story. And these are controversial. You know, there's certain games that really use them a lot. Uh, Metal Gear Solid, that's one of the games where they, there's just a lot of cut scenes. And the, I'm trying to remember the name of the... Uh, designer of that uh, Hideo 
I have to look that up. But anyway, uh, he's known for putting a lot of cutscenes in there. Some people like it. Uh, some people don't like it. Uh, here's the reasons why you might want to put them in. Uh, they talk about introducing a central narrative tension, right? So here's here's what's going on, like we saw with the Arkanoid game. Uh, here's what these here's what you are. Here's what these blocks are. You know, it sort of says here's why you should care about what's going on. Uh, two, shaping the narrative in a certain direction. Uh, so a lot of times you want to, you know, get the player to that next plot point. You know, get the player over here to do this thing. Uh, sometimes they talk about a game being on rails. Uh, that means that you can't just go anywhere, right? You have to follow a script, basically, and go where the designers want you to go. <clears throat> Compensating for missing game narratives. Uh, so this is kind of, they talk about a passing of time. So you know, the, tomorrow, uh, this is what happens. You know, Gabriel Night 3 is like this. You know, you do certain things, and then it'll say nighttime. You know, then that passes, and then you wake up, and it's the next day. Uh, there's a lot of games like that. I think it's probably more common to see this journey motif. And this is really clever. So the game designers figured out pretty early on that nobody wants to just sit there looking at a screen that says loading. And this is bar. <laughs> oh, how exciting. I'm just looking at this bar fill up. <laughs> oh, what a, you know, what content. And so instead of doing that, uh, what a lot of them will do is have a scene where it's showing you uh, like a map. And they'll show your plane or your group of characters going up somewhere on the map. Uh, really what's happening is the game is loading. You know, it's, it's just giving you something to look at that's halfway interesting and suggestive of uh, a story. And giving you some sense of like how far away this is. You know, look at, it took, It wasn't just it took a long time to load, uh, but it took a long time for these this wagon or whatever to get all the way across uh, the map. Uh, so that's what they're getting at there. Uh, let's see, associate the game with contemporary cinema aesthetics. In other words, they want the game to look impressive. Yeah, so they will do things like, like, like the god rays or these particle effects or fog or whatever. Or lens flares. I always thought that was the dumbest thing. Like what, is there like a camera there with my Final Fantasy characters? <laughs> you know, there's like a lens flare from the sun. <laughs> Uh, well, no, uh, but they do that to kind of make it look more like a movie. So we think, wow, that looks really, that's really popping. You know, it looks really uh, realistic. It's dramatic. Uh, it's just something that they're kind of borrowing from cinema. It doesn't always make sense, but, you know, it's what we're used to seeing. Uh, and then finally, just providing the information. Right? They call the exposition, the information dump. You know, what's, what's happening? What's happening here? What's going on? And sometimes they just dump all this on you in the form of a cutscene. Now well, let's see what else we have here. Uh, character types in video games. Right, so similar to the, just the objects, you have stuff on the screen, you might have people or you know creatures on the screen. And I like the way they break this up. They've got four categories of characters. Uh, one is just a stage character. So they say this is just part of the scenery, right? So if you watch uh, something like Hamilton, you know, they might have people just in the back somewhere. You can barely see them. Uh, they're just standing there. They're not contributing much to the story. You know, they don't have any lines. They're not dancing. It's, they're just kind of there. <laughs> kind of uh, literally just kind of set the stage uh, just by being there. Uh, you see them in movies, right? They'll have extras. You know, these are people just walking around. They're, they're not really serving any purpose beyond just being seen. Uh, then you have the functional characters. So they serve some kind of general function. So it's like a certain type of character will attack you. If you a lot of role-playing games, if you see an orc, orc's probably going to attack you. Right? So it's not just there for decoration. It will attack. Uh, but it's, you know, there's a million of them, right? There's, it's not just one character with a well-defined uh, personality. I was kind of wondering if non-player characters would fit in there. Uh, so what's called NPCs. You know, so you might have a character that runs a bar, runs a store, or something like that. You know, I, th I would say they're kind of serving functions because you can go to a different town and there's the same sort of character there uh, doing the same thing. Uh, then we have the cast. So this is a character that's more or less a main character, an important character, right? That has some specific function. You know, if we were talking about NPCs, I would say these would be the named characters. So they have a name, some part to play in the plot, the story. 
Uh, maybe they will. Maybe you'll talk to them several times throughout the game. Maybe they will develop. Uh, they got some kind of agenda of their own. Uh, so they're they're doing more than just there to give you information or something, right? They're serving some role in the drama. And then of course the player that you control yourself. That's the player, the avatar. Uh, so what is some of the stuff that is in the future for characters? Uh, one is this idea of AI driven characters. So part of the problem is when you're creating a game, you have to create all the dialogue in advance, right? You have to figure out what, what is this character going to say? If you say this, here are the options, and here's some more options, but you're writing all this out. You have to anticipate everything, basically. And so that you can see why this gets uh, too much to keep track of after a while. So what Michael Mateus and Andrew Stern did, I said, maybe we could make this procedural or just have the computer sort of generate responses. So you could type in anything. And somehow it would look as though uh, these characters were actually responding to the, whatever the person comes up with uh, versus the, just selecting from a menu. So I could say, for example, instead of just saying, what do you want to do here? You want to say hello? Do you want to slap the character? Do you want to... Uh, you know, give the character uh, a handshake. You know, give you like three options. Uh, this you can just type in anything you can think of, and it tries to it tries to fool you or it tries to uh, respond in a way uh, that seems like it actually understood uh, that command. So it's pretty neat. And they did this with what they call beats, these action. So you do something and there's a reaction. These all these uh, paired combinations. Uh, there's many many of those. As you will see if you play the game, the a lot of uh, it's sort of cartoony looking graphics, but they, uh, the way that their eyes move and their facial expressions, uh, those are very uh, you know realistic. That part is, but they're trying to create scenes, acts, and stories so it'll be different every time you play it. It's sort of generated by the program instead of just somebody coming up with all these different choices for you. So I want you to check this out. It's you know it's been a little dated now. I'm kind of surprised we're still talking about facade. You know, I remember when this thing came out, I thought, wow, this is the future, you know. <laughs> I can't wait to see, like, the next generation of this. But it still seems like this is about as good as it gets, you know, in terms of uh, procedural dramas. I don't know. You know what's happening there. There seems to be some stalling. Maybe they've already hit the, the capacity of what's possible. Uh, anyway, spend some time if you can. I know it's, I'll put a link there so you can download Facade. You know, it does, you will have to download it and get it to run. It can be challenging depending on your setup. Uh, so if, you, if you're able to do that, fine. Uh, play the game at least once. It's like 10 minutes. You know, see, type in the weirdest stuff you can come up with and see if you like the way that this game handles reactions. How uh, do these characters seem convincing? Uh, if you just can't get it to work, that's fine. I have an alternative here, just a browser-based thing. It's not quite as good for many reasons, but at least it's kind of an AI you can sort of play with, play tic-tac-toe with her. Uh, Mitsuka. Uh, so you could try this out. And again, the idea with her is that there's not just a whole bunch of pre-programmed responses. Uh, she will, uh, you know, depending on what you type in, it will try to parse it, analyze it, and then come up with a uh, plausible seeming response. And so some people love this stuff, you know. Uh, but, you know, go ahead, try it out, see what you think. All right, here we are with the avatars again. And I always thought this was a fascinating discussion. Uh, but the idea is, you know, somebody's got to play your game, right? And you want them to feel comfortable in that character's shoes. Or you want it to be fun for them to play this character, uh, right? You know, same thing when you're playing Dungeons and Dragons or, or, or whatever. Uh, or Skyrim, any of these sorts of games. A lot of people like to create their own characters, and they choose characters that sort of match with their own uh, personalities, or at least their values, or the way they would like to be, or maybe they just want to try something. Uh, but anyway, the point here is that in a lot of these games, you don't actually see your avatar. And I always think about something like Master Chief from Halo. You know, he's, you know, he, maybe it's not a he. We don't really... If you just looked at these uh, of the photos there, of course, in the game, you're looking out through the visor. Uh, but you could sort of imagine, you know, there are certain sequences where you do hear Master Chief and things. But, you know, that that aside, put, putting the cutscenes aside, you know, most of the time it's, it's kind of like it's just you there. You're looking out. Uh, you're not seeing uh, Master Chief as a character. 
Uh, so there's a uh, makes it a little bit easier, I think, to uh, to uh, what's the word I'm looking for to inhabit that role, if you will. Uh, and also, I think the same with any character that's encased in a suit of some sort. So you can kind of imagine that that's you in the suit, right? You know, you, this could be you in this uh, armor. So I notice a lot of games will do this. Even if it's third person, they'll put they'll have you in a suit of some sort so it doesn't look like a person. And I think part of that I, idea there, what makes that work, is that you can kind of imagine that's me. You know, the same thing with the superhero comics. You know, they have the costumes on. And I think a lot of the what makes that appealing is that you can kind of imagine that's you in the suit. You know, once you see a well-defined character there, you kind of step back. You know, I think about Sp if you read Spider-Man or Batman. When it's Bruce Wayne, and you're looking at Bruce Wayne, that feels a lot different as a viewer than when it's Batman, you know, with the mask on and all that, and you kind of uh, <clears throat> almost imagine that's you. Okay, let's see what else is here. Now, one theory is the stronger the personality of the character the easier it is for a player to feel alienated from it. Right, so that, this goes back to fiction. We'll talk about this in more detail uh, in a minute. But, you know, the idea is if you want, the more stuff you put onto a character, especially if it's a main character, now you can make it seem like, it makes it hard for the reader to identify with somebody, you know, if that person is very different than they are. Right, so it can create some distance. It can make it sort of hard to get into the story. You know, in science fiction, there's this problem with uh, aliens. So a lot of uh, science fiction authors, they want to have stories about aliens, you know, where the aliens are the main character. Uh, but the problem is nobody wants to read those stories because if you really have something bizarre or that's really different, it's just too hard to relate to. It just doesn't make for a very fun character. Uh, instead, uh, the idea is you make it more human-like. You know, you have a Klingon. Okay, yeah, it's... It, uh, Klingons look very different, but really, you know, they're very similar to certain types of people. Uh, same thing with Vulcans. You know, elves, you know, you, you know, you can change up some superficial stuff, but basically they're relatable. Or even uh, cartoons, you know, Scooby-Doo. You know, Scooby-Doo doesn't act like a real dog. <laughs> or those dog movies we are talking about earlier. Uh, they make them seem almost like humans, and that's what makes it fun to watch those. Uh, so I think that's kind of what they're getting at there. If you're doing a biography, you know, if you got Abraham Lincoln, if you've seen the movie Lincoln, you know, I didn't watch that movie feeling like I was Lincoln. You know, I, it's just kind of interesting from, uh, you can look at the performance, you can think about how much he feels like Lincoln, etc. And it's a very different kind of movie. And let's see the counterpoint there. Stock characters are often just as compelling. Oh, yeah, I need to talk some more about this. So. Now, the idea is that in great literature, or some people feel like this, the critics will say, if it's a really great work of fiction, then the characters are well-developed. Uh, they've got very strong uh, personalities. I'll talk about strong, well-rounded characters. They're unpredictable. They feel like uh, real people. Uh, so that a lot of critics will say if a story doesn't have that, it's just got what, what are called stock characters. You know, these sort of characters that you see time and time again. You think about all the sort of typecast uh, characters uh, from all the different movies. You know, there's the villain, there's the, you know, the helpful, old, uh, wise person. You know, all these sort of tropes, characters that you see time and time again. You think about Western films. <laughs> you know, <laughs> all these sort of characters you're used to seeing over and over and over again. You know, if it's a high school thing, you just sort of got the, uh, the jock character. You got the underdog character. You've got the... You know, sort of wacky outcast characters. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so what some of these designers say is that, yeah, that probably doesn't make for very good fiction, but in the game it can work out pretty well because you don't really need to have this in-depth relationship. You can just recognize the stock character. You know what to do with that stock character, and it uh, works. Uh, now we're getting into how to organize a game narrative. So since it's interactive, again, you can't just have the standard linear path. Uh, that's a very boring game. There's not much of a game if it's just one way to play it. Uh, so here we have different ways to make choices along the way, different alternatives. Uh, so there are a number of these. Uh, these are the most common types, I would say. Uh, so I'll cover those in some detail here. 
Uh, so you have the branching narrative. So if you think again about those choose your own adventure books or any game where there's moments where you have to make a decision, you know, do you go left, do you go right, do you uh, marry this person or do you kill this person, you know, whatever. Uh, so if you think about it, if you step back from that and just look at it like an outline of the story, it would look something like this. You know, so here's where you start. Once upon a time, there was a time traveler, yada, yada. And then you get to the first choice. Do you go back in time or do you go forward in time? So if you go back, you go over here. If you go forward, you go over here. And then there'll be choices from there and choices from there and so on. Now, the problem with this is you can see how already just with one, two choices, we've only made two choices, and but all the already we're up to what one two three four five six seven eight different endings so that's just a lot of uh, writing a lot of stuff to have to keep track of and plus you know by the time you get over here there's a lot that you're missing out on as a reader you know you haven't seen this stuff over here uh, so you have to go back and play it again and again to see all these different uh, paths which you might think is cool but you know on the other hand there's just content there that somebody produced that nobody that you have not seen so it's kind of wasteful in terms of uh uh, resources or assets that it takes. I mean, you think about all the graphics, the artwork, the voice acting that goes into this choice that you don't even see. Uh, so we'll talk about some alternatives to that. Uh, here's the open world model. So this one, I don't know any game really. There's a few games, I guess, that are just completely open. You can do whatever you want, whenever you want. Uh, usually there's at least an exposition at the beginning. Uh, but this would be, I guess, if you really could just do it anyway. You know, there's just no connection. Uh, it's just kind of totally up to you. Yeah, and here's uh, Marie Laurie Ryan. Uh, she's got a couple of books, or I don't know, probably a dozen by now, where she talks about interactive narratives. And she's really detailed. And she's really good at coming up with these uh, classification systems. You know, as you can see here, this she's got a bunch of stuff like this <coughs> if you read her books. And I'll show you a cover, the cover of it in a minute. Uh, but you can see she's got the complete graph structure where you can sort of get to any point. You know, it's basically see all the content. Uh, the network structure. Let me turn that off so we don't get <laughs> pestered by that. Uh, let's see, where was it? Yeah, the network structure. So you can think about these nodes and how these work. Uh, there's the tree structure we were looking at earlier. The side branches. So they talked about a game with a side quest. And that's just something you can go off and do that. You could do it. You could decide not to do it. It's a side quest. But if you do it or if you don't do it, eventually you're going to proceed to that next big chapter of the game. <clears throat> and then these other ones are basically just variations of this. Now one of the things that Twine lets you do, I think that's kind of what they're trying to represent here with these hyphens. We'll talk more about it in a second. But instead of having completely different uh, choices like this, and, you know, completely different nodes, uh, what you can do is set up variables and keep track of those throughout the game. So what, what could happen is you could actually have this one choice here, but you could have different things appear on the screen depending on earlier choices. So that's really cool, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute. But it's something to keep in mind. You don't necessarily have to have discrete nodes. You can just change up a line or two, or change up just a very subtle thing, and it feels like it's responded to your choice uh, when really you're just changing up a little bit of text. Uh, okay, so here we're getting into this idea of the player response theory that you've been writing your essays using. That's the theory behind that uh, reception. Uh, so I don't want to spend a lot of this kind of advanced stuff, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the literary theory. Uh, you're certainly welcome to read the books on that if it interests you. Uh, so I'll just keep it really simple though. There's a few things I think are good for you to know about. Uh, one is Wolfgang Iser, his theory of the literary repertoire. Uh, so that idea is that there's, we sort of bring stuff to the table before we even start reading a book. So if I, if I handed you a book and said, this is a Sherlock Holmes novel, uh, Hound of the Baskervilles, uh, I think you'll enjoy this. So my guess is, if you've never read that story before, you're like, okay, Sherlock Holmes, you know, I sort of have a picture of, you know, what he looks like, the hat, the pipe. <laughs> there's going to be a mystery to solve. Uh, there's going to be clues. 
Uh, so even though you haven't read that story, you've already kind of inferred, you, you can sort of get a feel for what that book is going to be like. Now, some of it could be wrong, uh, but you, since it is kind of this detective fiction, you know, the, you know you've seen so much Sherlock Holmes stuff, you got a pretty good feel for that book already. Now, if I said it's a game, a Sherlock Holmes game, you know, same stuff. And so they use the example of uh, one of the Resident, Resident Evil games, Resident Evil Code Veronica X. I don't, I'm trying to, I don't know if I've played this one or not. But I pulled the poster here. So I can tell just by the way that this is written, it's everything you feared. <laughs> so it doesn't take you very long. And of course, once you start the game, you'll see, oh, it's a scary game. It's in the horror, survival horror genre. You know, so this game will be about trying to survive and there'll be scary stuff coming out at me, you know, zombies or what have you, scary moments, uh, jump scares. Uh, and they say, even if you haven't played any of these games, though, you might still be reminded of the horror films you might have seen, the music and things. Uh, you might also know just from playing other games that even if you get stuck, you know, you can find a walkthrough and get your way past that puzzle or that moment to figure out what it is you need to do. So there's certain things you are bringing to the table. So they talk here about the repertoire is cued into the game in ways such as the music that reminds you of a scary movie. All right, so if you hear that tense music, the strings, you know, you know, whatever, it's like, oh, okay, I think I get it. <laughs> I don't think something happy is going to happen. You know, it sounds like scary stuff. Now, let's see, reader response. Uh, so we're picking up here again with this idea of something. What is the game? What is the play? What is Hamlet? Uh, so that's what this theory is all about. It's, it's really what it is. is what is happening in your brain as you're performing it or doing it, reading it. You know, if you're reading the book, that's what it is. <clears throat> if it's a play, and then it's you're there watching the play. The play is going on. Uh, the game, uh, what is, this is a Telltale, uh, the Walking Dead game. So you could say, well, the actual game is when you're sitting there playing it. That's that's the game. If you're just reading about it, that's not the game. If just the disc itself, that's not the game. It's only uh, actualized, if you want to use a fancy word, <laughs> through, re uh, through reading it or playing it. Now, what's interesting about this is just mentally, psychologically, what's happening in the brain as you are playing this game or reading the story. And they, they've done research on this to find... Or one of the findings is that we really are filling in a lot of gaps. So there's a there's a lot more that's not being shown, not being told. That we're just sort of filling in. We're imagining it's there. You know, sometimes you talk to people about a game and they'll just be not intentional, but they'll just be making up stuff like that wasn't actually part of the game. You're just imagining that happened or that conversation happened or that character was there. Was it even there? Uh, it just it made sense to them. You know, this kind of part of the story they were creating as they were playing. So they just put it in, uh, unaware. It's just kind of bizarre, really, how that happens. Um, Scott McCloud has a book called Understanding Comics, which is, you know, this book is called Understanding Video Games. So I think they got that idea from him. But he talks about that in between panels. You know, the comics are only showing you like a little picture of one's moment, but your brain is like filling in all the stuff. So if you see a character kind of reared back like this, next next uh, panel, you know, kapow. <laughs> uh, you start, so your brain just sort of kind of fills in that motion in between those panels and you can see it in your mind, you hear it, the thud, you know, it's, a lot of stuff is just a, being imagined. <clears throat> so that's the idea. It's not just what is there in the text or what you see in a screenshot. And there's a lot of stuff that's filled in mentally and that's what really that work is. And then the other theory that I thought was interesting <clears throat> or useful is this Gordon uh, Kaleha, Kaleha's uh, theory or term, autobiography. Uh, so I like this idea of the biog bi <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so it's not an autobiography, which would be just a story of your life or something like that. It's an alter biography. So what what is that? You know, they define it. Uh, Gordon def defines this as the active construction of an ongoing story that develops through interaction with the game world's topography, or the, you know, what you can, the game space, I guess, uh, the inhabitants or characters, 
objects in the game rules and simulated environmental properties. And so there's a lot going on there to unpack, <clears throat> but the idea is we're moving away from this idea of a, being told a story, which is really not what's happening in a game, right? There's, it's not like somebody sitting across from you just telling you a story. Uh, instead, it's the story's being created sort of on the spot. It's being generated, and you're playing a part in that. So I guess Kaliha, Kaliha sees this as a very different process. So I like this, this term, autobiography. You know, I like to read more about this uh, this theory because it seems to be, you know, I like that idea of the story generation instead of storytelling. All right, so just to kind of wrap this up here, uh, again, this is very advanced material at this point, the literary theory. If this is interesting to you there's a, and you want to learn more for free, uh, go to Open Yale Courses and type in literary theory. And there's a professor there, I forget his name, but he's got a whole course uh, I think he's at Stanford, or not Stanford, yeah, Open Yale. He's at Yale. <laughs> uh, but he, he might have graduated from Stanford. But anyway, uh, it's, a, it's a Yale course, so you, you can basically see what the course is like, it's, but instead of having to pay the hundreds of thousands of dollars to, for the tuition, uh, you can just see the lectures. Uh, he does a really good job, I think. He uses the story of the steamboat or a little train engine train engine that could or whatever. Uh, but he walks you through all these different literary theories and it's a very friendly approach uh, to the topic. But uh, anyway, obviously there's whole courses you can take on literary theory. Uh, here's the ones that typically get brought up in the context of uh, games. So if you go to a game studies conference, they probably would have expected you to know about these or at least recognize them. Uh, here's Marie Laurie Ryan again, Narrative is Virtual Reality. Uh, she, she's the one, recall, that did all those diagrams about the interactive narratives. Uh, Janet H. Murray and uh, Brenda Laurel both write about uh, computers as theater, so they use the analogy of uh, stage productions, uh, which does make a, you know, quite a bit of sense, you know, I think, especially if you get into something like uh, uh, interactive theater or LARPing, you know, there's not that much uh, difference between those two. And if you ever watch uh, Star Trek The Next Generation or any of the later Star Trek stuff, they have this thing called the holodeck, and that's the holodeck that she's referring to there. And so the idea of uh, what's in the future, you know, how are these stories going to be told? There's a lot of uh, very interesting stuff to think about. Now, okay, I want to stop here for a moment because I want to switch over and start talking about this uh, lock method. Uh, so we'll end that lecture there, and I will uh, resume or in a different video so we can talk about James Scott Bell's uh, lock method. But if you do, let me just skip to the last slide here. Uh, so if you do have questions or comments about this lecture, you know, please put them into the box. <laughs> and I hope you'll join me soon uh, for part two.